And so I think the balance is being able to see them for who they are, image bearers, but then letting the one who created them do the work. Do the work. Yes. In their life. Yes. And giving him the space to do the work and setting the boundaries that we need to to protect ourselves. In some cases, God says, lean in. In other cases, he says, lean out. When we were... um, pastoring the church in LA, so urban. It was in between one of our many services and I was driving to get food for the kids, just taking a little break before we come back. And so driving down the street, I mean, it's not very far. I pull in and um, I notice that there is a, an older gentleman who was clearly struggling, you know, probably definitely unhoused. And I just kind of well, I'm going to reach over to, you know, grab something to give him, just some cash or whatever. And I just kind of rolled down the window and I'm about to put it out. And I felt the Spirit of God say to me, will you look at him? Will you look at him? And so I kind of stopped and I rolled the window all the way down, right? And I grabbed his hand and I looked at him and like, how you doing? Like, how you doing? And he told me a few things and I go, well, can I buy you something to eat? So then I got out of the car and I got him something to eat and then he went on his way. And I just thought I almost missed a moment to see him. Yes, see him. And I just think, so how many times do we do that? But then sometimes it's easier in that situation because I didn't know him. There um, was a time when this person... um, really started this lawsuit against me and this whole process. And it was, it was ridiculous and painful and horrible. And you have to go sit around this mediation table and I'm listening to her, wow. you know, lie. And um, I'm a fighter, right? I fight for people. I'm like, if you want me on your side. I mean, I have a black belt in karate. I'll hurt somebody for you, right? So I'm a fighter. And so I'm sitting there listening to her say stuff and um i'm just so angry and it's not true and and all of this and so then they're like doing their all their legal talk and um then it's this part's about to be over and so we're walking out of the room and i felt the spirit of god say to me i need you to go look at her and i need you to hug her wow so i I did so i walked over and i wanted to do like you know how you go and you know that hug Mm -hmm. and um but I knew what he was asking me to do, right? So I looked her in the face and I hugged her like till something changed in me, wow. right? And so wow. Wow. like I knew her story. She had been an addict. I knew her story. Yeah. And so somewhere she had lost a little bit of who she was, mm. but I needed to be the one at least who saw the Imago Day in her, yes. right? And then honestly, sometimes the hardest person to see is my own husband. Mm. Oh, no. Yeah. Mm. Nobody can hurt you like your husband, yeah. Yeah. True. right? The, they know you. They they know which buttons to push. And um, and there's been some times that I've been in some conflicts with Philip, and I just I don't see any God in him. <laughs> like I'm just. And so I think for me, like that's been the like just the journey that I've been on is trying to work really hard at seeing God in people. And I don't think it's, it's my, I don't think it's my natural inclination at all, yeah. right? I think my natural inclination is to see where we're different or to see where you're wrong or to see where you need help or whatever. It's mm-hmm. not to go, I see God in you. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so the other day when you like honored us by looking at each of us and say, I see God in you, I'm like, I want to be like you because I, I don't feel like that's my natural thing. I feel like I've had to work hard to hear God's voice, to see His image in people. When you begin to understand um, that you are made in the image of God, that that Imago Dei gives you such dignity and royal part of heaven's royal family, it changes how you see other people. Because so often it's, we're, we're quick to judge as human beings. You know, we'll maybe see some people in the street who are 
you know, clearly living homelessly. And it's easy to make judgments about what might have happened to their life. But I remember interviewing someone once, and he'd written a book called When There's No Place Like Home. And he talked about the fact that he was a very well-known doctor in Harley Street in London, which is where our kind of professionals, the kind of people who are the creme de la creme of doctors have their private clinics. But He was also an alcoholic, and through the disease of alcoholism, he lost his practice, he lost his marriage, and he lost all the significant relationships in his life. And he ended up living rough on the streets. And he told me that one day he was walking along Oxford Street in London, which is a very busy street, and he suddenly caught the image of someone in, he didn't realize it was actually a mirror, he thought it was someone inside a store. And they looked ragged, and his immediate impression of the person was, well, there's a loser. And then he realized that actually it was himself. And he talked about the fact that it was only when he was able to come back into relationship with Christ and have his life rebuilt that he began to understand that even in his worst moments, the image of God was still there. And it has completely changed how he sees other people. He now spends his life with people who are dealing with alcoholism or homelessness and reminding them, calling them out, understanding they bear the image of God. I think sometimes when people have really hurt us, Mm. it's easier to see Judas in them. hundred million percent. (laughs) Yes. When you feel betrayed by somebody, it's really hard to see Christ in them. And in my own life right now, I'm, somebody has really deeply hurt me. And um, having this spiritual practice every morning of when I, actually when I make my coffee is when I think about them. And I imagine how Jesus came to me when I was his enemy and put his hand on my chest and said, Shalom, mm. reconciled himself to me and brought me into the kingdom. So I've been trying to imagine myself laying my hand on that person's chest and saying, shalom, Mm -hmm. Um, the wholeness and completeness of God. I want peace with you. Because when we think about who we're called to be as image bearers, we've been given the identity of ministers of reconciliation. That's who we are supposed to be. It's really started to turn my heart for that person in a way nothing I had done (laughs) Was because that person has wounded me so deeply, I was really struggling to see Jesus in them. But when I can go ahead and say, oh, Jesus laid his hand on me and said, shalom. Oh, that's good. Can I, lay, can I just imagine laying my hand on their chest? And this is a process. We've talked about this all week. These aren't one-time things. Mm-hmm. We have, it's the layers of an onion. We just have to keep working it down yeah. and working it down. I have to keep doing it morning after morning. Can I imagine myself laying my hand on their chest, saying shalom? Oh. Because it may not ever change the situation between the two of us, but it's changed something in my own well, heart right. towards well, that, that person. That's, I mean, it's just like when you forgive someone, it may never change them, but it yes. will definitely change yeah, you. So yes. it's just like it has to change something in me. Otherwise, I'll yes. stay bitter and angry. You know, part of rightly reflecting the image of God in the world is to be a minister of reconciliation. That is what Christ himself did when he came down from heaven, when he went to the cross. He sacrificed himself and absorbed all of our sinfulness and all of our brokenness and gave all of his perfectness, all of his rightness to reconcile us to God, to atone for our sins, to make us at one with God. So then now for us, if our our vocation is to be God's reflection into the world. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. That means actually, how to become, how do I be a peacemaker in the world? How do I go ahead and reach out to my enemy? Put my hand on their chest and say, Shalom. What does it look like to, you know what? Like last week, I actually wrote a card with a plate of cookies and um, left it down at a neighbor who there was a tender relationship over something that had happened in the past. It was really beautiful. By that evening, that neighbor had called me. We had a lovely conversation. She invited me over some evening to go ahead and have tea with her. Those small steps of how can I live a cruciform life, reaching out to somebody and passing on the grace and kindness of the Lord that the Lord has given me onto them starts to go ahead and mend some of the brokenness in the world, we can be part of ushering in more of the shalom of God. 
The hard right? thing about Judas and Jesus is they were both at the same table. Yeah. It's people that are close to us. It is. It hurts That so. have the ability to hurt us more than, like if yeah, some right. stranger, I mean, I read something somebody wrote about me the other day on, uh, and I thought, well, that's just weird because <laughs> we, we've never even met each other. And, you know, you already said all these personal things about me and I'm, but it didn't, I mean, it surprised me and it kind of annoyed me, but it didn't really hurt me. But, but you're right. It's, it, I, I personally think that marriage is probably about the best place right. to work through stuff and to understand what it means to be like Jesus, to turn toward him. Because I remember at one point when Barry and I were in a really bad place, he had done something that I personally had decided in my own self-righteous mind was unforgivable. And he had asked if we would go and see a counselor. And I'm like, absolutely not. There's no point. You know, I'm done. And he said, um, would you just at least think about it? Would you please think about it? And so he found somebody who made an appointment. And I said, well, let's go in separate cars. And he said, well, we're going to the same place. Why? And I'm like, because I might not want to speak to you at the end. So let's just take our own cars. So we're driving. And I've talked on one of the show, shows earlier about this ongoing companionship of Christ during the day. So in the car when I'm driving there, I mean, I just prayed. I said, Holy Spirit, please show up. Because yep. if I go in there just by myself, yep. it's not going to be good. So I'm asking you, please, will you come in with me? And so we got there and I went in and sat down. And the counselor asked Barry how he was doing and he said, not well. Mm. And he was in a really, a, an honest place of, you know, being honest and not doing well. Mm -hmm. And then the counselor said to me, how are you doing? And I said, um, no, I'm not good. And then the counselor said, listen, let me ask you something, Sheila. He said, I was um, talking to an older gentleman one day and I asked him, who is your favorite person? And this older gentleman said, um, well, my tailor. He said, why would your tailor be the f your favorite person? And he said, because every time I see him, he takes fresh measurements. And he looked at me and he said, Sheila, could you take fresh measurements? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, it was just this beauty and grace of the Holy Spirit saying to me, we can do this. Mm -hmm. We can do this. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and I can honestly say, I love my husband way more now than I did when we were first married. And at one point I thought we didn't have a chance, you know, but it's just this beauty of this companionship of Christ, recognizing, because I said, I saw him differently that day, you know, after I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, we can, we can do this, seeing him as someone for, that Jesus died for, just like he died for me and how lost we both would be without him. Yes. And it's, we have so much to be thankful for because we're never left alone in anything. Yeah, yeah. And the power that grace laid its arms down across a beam for us, grace never stops reaching out. The gospel isn't something we just accept. The gospel of grace is something that we extend. Right. Jesus, he extended the grace to me. How can I not then pass yeah, that absolutely. grace on yeah. to you? Absolutely. But. We can't do that in and of ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to come alongside us and keep taking our hand and saying together, yeah, we can do this. You know, the Bible says that we need to pray for those who persecute us. And I think when we see the image of God in them, we can pray for them. But I also think it's important for us to remember that that doesn't mean that we're going to stay in relationship with people who continually our hurt us. Tell us this. Yeah. People Give us who the wisdom. exhibit a pattern of hurting us. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, sure. I, I think about your example. That touches my heart that that the Lord told you to go do that and and to just wrap your yeah. arms around her for you. Yeah, it was for me. I mean, we right? were in relation we we had no connection. To up. change your it heart. Was to change me. And and that doesn't mean that God also said, and then stay in real in that yeah. relationship. Yeah. Because she has work to do to yeah, heal, yeah. Yes, right? Yes. And, and you need to give her that space. Yeah. And so I think the balance is being able yeah. to see them for who they are, image bearers, but then letting the one who created them do the work. Do the work. Right. Yes. In their oh, life. Yes. And giving him the space 
to do the work and setting the boundaries that we need to, to protect ourselves. In some cases, God says, lean in. In other cases, he says, lean out and let me, let me do the work. And there's a willingness. To me, it's like, there's a difference between, I mean, I don't know how she responded to your hug, Holly. I would imagine maybe pretty stiff and didn't, but, but in my situation, it's totally different. When somebody's in a place of, you know what, Lord, I deserve nothing. Yeah. However, if you will help me, everything will change. It's easy to love God. It's just His people. <laughs> and and that's, that's true, right? But His people are made in His image. And we have to love people. We have to recognize God's image in people. And we live in a very fallen world. We don't live in the Garden of Eden, right? We live in a very fallen world. And so because of that, we've each experienced wounds. We've each experienced suffering and betrayal and disease and pain, all of that. And so that breaks us, right? It hurts us. And so it can kind of bring damage. And so then sometimes that that damage surfaces and then that's all we see in that person rather than recognizing the image of God in them. And truly, if we're going to bring change, we have to recognize the image of God in people and even in people who are so annoying. And uh, there are people who are hard to get along with, people who've hurt you, people who've let you down. Um, I've let people down. I've hurt people. And I still want them to see God in me. So just extend that to other people. I think sometimes when it's when we struggle, and I have so struggled sometimes to see the Imago Dei, to see the image of Jesus in somebody. I think of um, the strangers on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize Christ until they broke bread. Yeah. And I think um, there was a situation in my own life where um, someone saw me a certain way, and um, I reached out to that person and said, would you come and have dinner with me? Because I think, again, we can... Um, when we don't have close proximity to someone, we can distort our image That's of each so other. True. But if we can sit down and break bread around a table together, like Jesus broke bread and passed it down to Judas, mm-hmm. we can see the image of Christ. We may not agree with each other. Mm-hmm. We may not have ongoing relationship right. with each other. But I think sometimes to lean in, to break bread, can I be on a listening tour to at least hear your perspective and you hear mine? Then I think I'm um, we become ministers of reconciliation and part of the shalom in the world. Even if we can be kind to each other and cordial, that might not mean closeness, yeah. but what does it look like for us to be image bearers that we, we do reflect to the world? This is how we work with each other when we disagree and we have painful, tender yeah. moments together. Yeah. You know, in the Proverbs, when it says that iron sharpens iron, right? Because we're it's part of the, I mean, what's the purpose of that? So that we look like him. Yes. So it's the so sanctification good. purpose. But that's such a, we love like quoting that as iron sharpens iron, and one brother does to another. It's like, but the, the reality of that mm-hmm. is like, it <laughs> sparks. Yeah. sparks. Yeah. sparks. Yeah. And it's noisy and painful, yeah. and it doesn't happen in one thing. What's missing is that there's this arrogance and pride in the big church. And so we've lost the humility to go, what you were talking about, what do you, what do you see? Do you see any patterns in me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that's the iron sharpening iron. Do you see any patterns in me? And what, what, I, what, what do you think I should do? Yeah. Or, or if I say, you know, this person said this about me. Do you see that? Okay. Yeah. Is that that's true? And then going back to your question, because I don't think God would say it like that. Right. But do you see that? Yeah. So to me, that's that. Right. That's that. I, because the goal is sanctification. And, and the interesting thing, like, that's just like this, to me, this big Christian word that basically... Like, it means look like him, right? But it happens immediately when you say yes to Jesus, and then there's the process, mm. right? Yeah. Then you're, you're on the journey, yeah. and he w- works on one. To become, to better reflect like him, him right? right? But that iron sharpening iron, again, that happens in community. You need another piece of iron. Like, you have to, okay. how do we create re- yeah. space for relationship? When I think about, like, being made in his image, like, so, when I think about who God is, because if I'm made in his image, then it's... I'm part of who God is, mm. right? So he's the, the picture of forgiveness, yeah. right? So we've talked about that picture of forgiveness. He's the picture of love. So I've been made to love. That that's mm-hmm. should be the default in me. Yeah. 
seeing other people through the eyes of God, seeing them as created in his image changes me in one huge way because it helps me see God as bigger and more clear than I would have without them. If I only saw God through my own lens, through my own perspective, through my own story, through my own self, then I would be missing out on so much of who He is and how He shows up in the world. And so it changes my heart when I actually begin to look at everybody else and see them not only as created by God, but His because I want to pay attention to what he's doing in their life, how he's moving in their life, how he might be changing and growing them, and what I can learn from them as I grow and change too. When I think about actively trying to treat people like they're made in the image of God, a practice that I has felt helpful for me is that I cannot change how I feel. I cannot change how I feel. I, I want to be kingdom-minded. I, I want to look at every person and say, I know who made you, and I know where you're going, and I'm going to treat you right. just like you're in the middle of that. But I can't always change how I feel, which is like not great mm -hmm. towards people. But one thing that I have control over that God's given me dominion over is my mouth. Yes. And I think in the year of our Lord, you know, today, we, we all kind of know how not to talk to people and we still get it wrong. But a, a place God has challenged me is how I talk about people, even in private and even in my own, even in the privacy of yeah. my own mind. Yeah. So not saying about anyone, he's the worst or she's the worst or they're crazy or what an idiot. Right. And of course, you and I, we wouldn't talk about anybody like that in front of people. Probably, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But even in our own minds, we will. Good. And God keeps reminding me, you have dominion right there over your own mind and your own mouth. So when you hear yourself say it, repent and receive the refreshment of grace and try again. Mm -hmm. Because nobody's the worst. Nobody's nobody's worth writing yeah. off. And that's helped me so much to, to bring into obedience what I can yeah. and see if my feelings will shift. That's yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, again, I, I'm just such a fan of repentance because I feel like it needs a rebranding in culture. Oh, yes, for sure. We, we come to the cross as a one-time repentance. But Martin Luther says repentance should be going the ongoing posture of a Christian. Yeah. How do we have a posture of repentance all of the time? Not just in our own personal private space with Jesus, but how do we create a culture and a DNA in our church faith communities where repentance is our general posture? And it's such a gift. It's a gift. And a lack of repentance makes us exhausted. Yeah. We feel like we have to be right all the time. And instead, we're saying to everybody, like, how do you think I could do that? Instead of being like, you know what? I probably did that. Yeah. That's on me. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Yep. And I think I, I think being great at apologizing to God and to people is actually what brings so much peace for us. So but I think this is also how we live this out well, is not to assume that we're going to treat everybody like they're made in the image yep. of God the first time, yep. right. but being ready to say we're sorry when we don't. Yes. Yeah. One of the words that we don't talk a ton about is the word repent. I mean, it's it's in Scripture a lot, but we tend to think of it as an old-fashioned word. I've discovered that repentance is a gift. Because if you're like me, what I honestly want more than anything else in my life is to walk closely with Jesus every single day. But I am human and I make mistakes and I fall. And I'll say something unkind to my husband or something careless. And, and I immediately feel that kind of ache in my spirit. And what I do is rather than trying to dismiss it or turn on the television or distract myself, is to immediately repent. And repentance, it simply means stop doing what you're doing and turn around and go in a new direction. And honestly, when I fall to my knees and ask for forgiveness, I feel the peace of Christ come on me and that the joy of companionship as we walk forward. It's not something God makes us do to be good Christians. It's a gift He gives us to be able to live. When we have something that's blocking how we see the image of God in them, something that we need to repent, yeah. our sin is a haze on the window hmm. of how we see people. Our, our, our sin is, it, it messes up the lens through which we yeah. see the people around us. And it's like, ooh, 
look at her. Look at all that she's got to fix. Right. When That's really so it's, uh, you've got to deal with your lens. You've got to deal with your triggers. You've got to deal with the things that are that you think is an issue with them, but really it's an issue with you. And you can't control them, but you can't control yourself. And so I think repentance is a big part of acknowledging our sin, acknowledging where we're, we've been hurt, acknowledging our deficits yeah. and asking the Lord to, to reveal those because that's what I can take ownership of. Yeah. You know, David said, see if there be any wicked way in me. Yes. Lord, I'm not asking that question enough. Yeah. But when I do ask that question, he, he begins to wash the lens. He begins to restore the lens of how I see people around me. And maybe they don't change, mm. but the way I see them changes because now I can clearly see God's image yeah. in them where before the lens was foggy. Now I see so clearly who they are in Christ and what that means and how I relate to them. So good. That's good. I think it's helpful to be in. My husband is really good <laughs> and gracious and kind and tender to tell me your windshield might have some steam on it and you're not seeing this clearly. <laughs> My so husband is not gracious and tender when he says it. <laughs> Just so clear. I think it's good to be in community with somebody who can yeah. say, "Hun, I understand why you're saying it. Your own wounds, yeah. your own yeah. triggering yeah. Yeah. could be really blinding you, which is why you go, huh. Right. I need to go do some own work in me. And to have a regular rhythm and practice, for me it's journaling, to have a daily examine yeah. about Exactly what David, Lord, look within my heart. See if there's anything within me that I need to bring to you. So it's that taking aside time every day yeah. to kind of just have like private repentance with the Lord. Examine yeah. my heart. Yeah. And I think there'd be so much would be helped in our own personal relationships in our yeah. families and in the big church if we had a regular rhythm of yeah. examine before the Lord. Lord, here's my heart. It's really good. Help me to go ahead and clear off where my, my lens, my windshield Sin and selfishness and my own perspective has, has distorted the image of God in that person and distorted my understanding of you. Yeah, Lord, help me to see this yes. how you see it. Yes. Help me to see her how you see her. Help me to see him how you see him. Even in the moment with your spouse, yeah. help me to see my spouse the way that you see them. You know, sometimes when someone triggers you, they bring up all of these emotions inside of you, you automatically assume that the problem is them. That friend says something that hurt you, you cut them out of your life. That pastor says something that bothered you, you stop going to that church. You know, oftentimes we respond to triggers by just cutting people out of our life instead of realizing that maybe one of the reasons that we're triggered is because of our own woundedness our own struggles, maybe even our own sin, our own pride, our own insecurities. This is why it's important for us to have a time of confession and repentance, a time where we acknowledge our areas of struggles, where we acknowledge our wounds, where we even acknowledge our sin and ask God to reveal to us what needs to be healed. We talked today about having a lens, with which you see the world. You see people through that lens. And if your lens is marked by trauma and brokenness and pain, you will see everybody through the lens of trauma and brokenness and pain. It's important to take the time to address the lens itself by inviting healing, by asking God to help you heal in deeper ways, by bringing mentors and counselors and trusted advisors into your life that can help you heal from some of those things so that you can see clearly as you engage in healthy relationships. The other thing that I've had to really draw from is when I've been hurt by someone and someone, you know, when you say that, someone comes to mind. Like, <laughs> you know, I have a you specific know person mm -hmm. that comes to mind and it has not been restored. Yes. But I imagine the fact that he loves her as much as he loves me. He wants her yep. to be sanctified and healed yep. as much as he wants that for me. He wants relationship with her. Yep. And and so when I yep. see her through through the lens that my father sees her, I still don't like what she does, but it softens my heart mm -hmm. towards her. 
always go back to the Psalms and it says that he knows that I'm but dust. But then can I look at somebody else and also say, mm-hmm. oh, he knows, but she's dust too. And do, can I look at her with the same kind of grace that he looks at my own dust I, and messiness? Because I think that we're, like, we've been entrusted right, with God's image mm-hmm. on planet Earth yes. to make it better, to Come bring on. his shalom. Yeah. Come on. And so a, a number of years ago, I was um, in a little car accident and I was just going through an intersection and the person just turned into me instead of waiting for me the other way. So it hit me. It wasn't a big deal, but it was enough of an accident. So we pulled over and um, I look at the, to the car in front of me and the, there's two women in there and I could see their hands just going like this. You know, there's a lot of energy happening up there. And one of them comes back out and runs to me and goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's not in my car and I'm so sorry and I'm going to be in so much trouble and are you okay? I'm like, hey, 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 we're good. We're good. I'm good. Are you good? We're good, right? And so then we um, like ex- exchange information because she's obviously going to fix my car. So then we talked like over the next couple of weeks, you know, as my car is getting fixed. And then in what was going to be our last conversation, um, she, uh, we're on the phone and she says to me, she goes, um, actually, my friend and I, the one that was in the car with me, we have this bet about what you do for a living. Wow. And I went, oh, interesting. Holly. Oh, holy. interesting. And um, she said, um, so can you tell us what you do? I go, no, actually, why don't you tell me what you think I do? <laughs> and so she said, well, um, actually, I think because you were not angry, not frustrated, I'm pretty sure that um, you must be a psychiatrist. <laughs> I went, actually, no. I started laughing. Was, ah. And she goes, well, my friend says, because you were just so calm and you didn't ever break sweat. She goes, she's pretty sure you're a yoga instructor. Hilarious. <laughs> wow. And I said, yeah, no. <laughs> and then she said, okay, so then what do you do? I said, well, actually, I'm a Christian. Mm. I'm a pastor of a church here in Los Angeles. Wow. And it was quiet. Like, and she couldn't get off the phone fast enough. Wow. And then that, that made me like really sad yeah. because I just thought like our reputation should be that there's pain and suffering here at call a Christian because they'll know how to bring the presence of God into yes. that situation. Oh, there's yes. like somebody hurting, bring a Christian because they'll know what to do. There's a, a marriage that's destruct. Bring a Christian, they'll know what to do. Like when Jesus told us to be salt and light, it was to make things better. Right. Right? So we're supposed, we've been entrusted with God. Right. Like, it's his image to step into situations. And I feel like that's not the reputation we have. Yeah, right. And so we're, we've been entrusted to bring a Mago day, day. Yeah. into we situations. We have rightly reflected. Right. And so I think, like, to me, uh, instead, when you ask somebody their interpretation or their image of what a Christian is, it's like, we're judgmental, we're critical, we're narrow-minded, we're like, whatever they're going to say. And I, that's what breaks my heart. I go, we've got a job to do. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's to reflect who God is. And so, and then, you know, Jesus, you know, he actually says, they're going to know you're my followers by how you love each other. So we can't even do that really great. We're so divided in everything. So we're not even reflecting who Jesus is so that the world can't see it. And then we're not bringing it when we have a chance to. And so I, for me, it, that was such a convicting thing. I just, I, I kind of just repented and just said, I'm so sorry, God, where have I not stepped into situations and brought your image? Where have I brought my judgment in my opinion and my thoughts? And where have I, you know, stormed in to try to fix things, but actually didn't bring who you were? We do have a responsibility on the planet as his image bearer, right? He gave us the role to, he's entrusted us with his kingdom, with the planet. He's entrusted us with this role of connecting with him and connecting with each other. So he's entrusted us to actually bear bear his image in such a way that it brings life to people, to situations. And so wherever you might be, whatever situation you might be in, I just want to encourage you to see yourself as that the image bearer of God. And when you are, when you're that image bearer, then that means you bring love, you bring kindness, you bring peace. You're not the one that brings stress to a situation. You take the stress away, right? We should be those people. And I think in a world that's so broken and hurting, what a great thing. It's a big mission. And you know what? God's trusted you with it. We can do it.
It's easy to say, where have we not brought your image? Where have we as the body of Christ? But it's where have I? Yes, because all of our eyes are creating the collective we. Like we, it starts with us. And I think it's easy for us to see where we haven't done a good job as the church. We, that group of people, this person, that person I'm thinking of. But where have I? Because pointing out where have we not brought the image of God doesn't actually change anything, nope. does it? Nope. The only thing that changes is when we begin to say, Lord, where have I? How can I reflect your image better in my home, in my family, in my church, in my community, to my kids, to my husband, mm -hmm. to the people that you've placed in my life? Like, create in me a clean heart. Yes. Show me where my lens is foggy and help me to do it better. One of the verses that just blows me away in that last incredible conversation that John records in his gospel in John 17, where mm -hmm. Jesus is going on to pray, not just for the disciples, but for us, you know, for those who will believe. Isn't that unbelievable? Like Jesus is I know, I know. But in verse 23, it says this, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and this is a bit that blows me away, and that you love them as much as you love me. Mm. I can't even wrap my heart around that that the world will know, may they experience such perfect unity, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. I mean, that's our commission. That's our, that's our whole job description right there, that we would love one another so much that there would be absolutely no doubt. They would be like, well, let's call a Christian. Right. We have distorted the image of God that the world sees. Um, we're back to repentance. How have we not followed our job description? How have we dropped the ball in our vocation to rightly be God's reflection into the world? And what would it look like to be have space and time for our own personal repentance and then collective repentance for how we have not been the image of God in the world? Yeah. Deeply convicting story. Yeah. It might be easier right? To be the image bearer when things are going great in our life. Mm. Yeah. Right? I mean, all two days <laughs> when everything you want is lining up. <laughs> Remember those days? Yeah, Tuesday last <laughs> few, <laughs> few months ago. <laughs> all two days. But I, I think that sometimes um, his image is most refined mm. in our weakness. Absolutely. Right? In our pain. I think so too. I think that's what the world notices. Yeah. It's easy to be an image bearer when life is good, but when you're walking through hard things, I think what comes out of us in those seasons is it means so much to people looking at us from the outside in. I think in that incident, when the car accident happens, how did you rightly reflect the image of God in that, the entire exchange? You had a posture of cruciformity a posture of surrender, a posture of open-handedness, a, a posture of, I don't need my own way, I can lay down. If we will really want to reflect the image of God in the world, how do we live a life that is cruciform, that looks like the cross, that looks surrendered, that looks like it's reaching out to other people and looks mm -hmm. given and isn't guarded and protected, but as a posture of, of vulnerability? Mm -hmm. th th those are hard things to do. We say we want to reflect the image of God. What does that mean? Am I willing then to step into places where it looks like I'm crucified, where it looks like I'm giving up things? Like, that's what it means to actually have a life that's shaped and formed like Christ. Yeah. And that can be complicated and hard, and it requires wisdom to know where is it safe to do that? What, yeah. yes, like what yeah. does that actually look like? So to accurately, to rightly reflect the image of God in the world, we need to be our lives to be shaped and formed like like Jesus himself who is God. What kind of life did Jesus live? He ultimately lived a life that is shaped and formed like a cross. That is shaped and formed in the posture of givenness for God so loved the world. He did what? He gave a posture of surrender into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. Into your hands, Father, I commit this problem, this issue. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my life. How do we live a posture that's truly is shaped and formed like a cross? 
that is the posture of surrender. That actually looks like reaching out to our neighbor, reaching out to our enemy, reaching out to God. We actually are, when you think about a cross, the form of the cross, all of the gifts come down that vertical beam of the cross and all of our praise goes up. So how do we take everything that God has given and then live into a posture of thanksgiving and give our gratitude back to the Lord. And then the horizontal beams of the cross to live a cruciform like, formed and shaped like the cross is how do I take all the gifts that He's given to me and then pass that grace on out into the world? That's what it really means to rightly image God is to live a cruciform life. In this conversation, we also have to be careful because yes. seeing somebody in the image of God and treating them that way not is not the yes. same as passivity, yes. right? Selflessness and being able to see people, yes. it's not the same as passivity, you know? And I think your story reflects that. Yes. You still had an insurance claim to file <laughs> yeah. and yeah. had to deal yes. with the problem. Yeah. The consequences were still there, but the response came with grace and respect. Yes. And so I think that's important for us too, as we're interacting with other image bearers, that doesn't mean there's no consequence. That's right. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I don't adjust how I interact in my expectations. That doesn't mean I remain passive. In abusive no, situations. Well, because you think about that, I actually, I appreciate that you use that word because Jesus was never passive. Right. Mm -mm. The image of God is not passive. No. It's peaceful. Yes. Yeah. Right? So, because passive people get overtaken. By life, by situations, by circumstances, by people. So it's like, no, yeah. we're not supposed to be passive. Like, I don't think ever, yeah. but peaceful. Get Always. Rid of it. And I think sometimes right? people misinterpret passivity for selflessness. Yeah. When the two are not one and no, the same. No, so not at all. That's so no good. The goal isn't the same. Right. Because the goal of passivity is like to hold back or to protect yourself or people pleasing. Or people pleasing. Yeah. The goal of passivity isn't to love people. Right, yeah. and to love we, them well. We think it is, you know, but when you really want to love someone, you scream, like, you are about to make a huge mistake. Or when you really love someone, you say, like, I, I love you so much, I will draw a boundary and say, you're not going to keep harming me, yes. because that is not actually yeah. good for you. Sometimes in the name of peace, we choose passivity. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause chaos. We don't want to make anybody upset. So instead of engaging, we pull back. We stuff our needs. We pretend like we don't really care and we choose passivity in order to have peace. But there is a difference between passivity and selflessness. Selflessness does not mean that we ignore our needs. Selflessness does not mean that we can't say no. Selflessness does not mean that we don't address our hurts and bring them to the table of relationships. I think oftentimes in the name of peace, we're actually choosing passivity. And passivity in the end will always hurt relationships because it leaves a trail of bitterness and resentment. So instead of being passive in your relationships, it's important to be assertive, to bring up what is on your heart, to bring up your needs, and to do it in a way that honors and respects the person in front of you, but also honors and respects your own needs as well. Treating people as who they are also means sometimes knowing they're gonna mess up. I think, again, this is where language is so interesting to me because sometimes I am a Christ follower. I'm the worst at putting words in my mouth about people that that they are expectations that they can't live up to. There's a path you in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, woe to you, you Pharisees. You put things on people that they can't even hold. And we do this just every day in our language when we say like, I can't believe you would, you would betray my trust like that. And what when we really should be saying like, I can believe that you betray my trust. People do that. That happens. Don't do it again, please. It hurt my feelings, but I can believe that, you know? Um, and I think the other piece that's so important here is keeping the actual enemy the enemy. Mm. And yep. in deeply painful situations, the enemy is the enemy. And even when you said earlier, Deborah, when you said, you know, when we say someone's hurt you, we all think of someone, it is wildly humbling to know that somebody thinks of us. Right. 
Well, we've hurt somebody. Some people we've hurt and we didn't do anything wrong. And some people we've hurt and we didn't know we did something wrong. And some people we've hurt and we knew we did it wrong and we're still feeling prideful about it. And in all of these things, to be humbled and sober-minded and say the enemy of our souls is the actual enemy here. People are not the enemy. Right. And that doesn't mean we don't draw boundaries. And that doesn't mean we don't say stop. Right. But it does mean that we fight spiritually yes. and that we acknowledge that when we fight the enemy, that's where we have victory. When we fight people, we come against the will and the heart of God. Yeah, this battle's very, not against flesh, flesh and blood. blood. It's very easy to get trapped there. Yeah. You know, if we are going to live out the vocation, yes, right, of Imago Dei, there's a soberness to it for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a casual, and I have failed many times. And so you dust yourself off because I've been extended grace. And once again, I will come to people and see God in them. It's interesting because you can't really demand they see God in you. <laughs> right? We pray. We pray. And we pray that the Lord keeps refining us yeah. and shaping us yeah. so that Christ is seen in it, us. It is this process. I think sometimes um, I, I feel like God showed me a picture a long time ago just about this journey of sanctification. And you know, when you first say yes to Jesus and there's this, this overwhelm, like I'm forgiven. I, it's like mm -hmm. this whole, and I'm just calling that door number one, right? So you're at door number one. And, but you're still a little bit of a mess. Like all of the, none of the behaviors went away. Maybe you're still, you know, addicted to something. You're still sleeping, sleeping around. All the things, like you're still doing all the things, but you know you're forgiven. And so now you like get to start this process is so much easier when you are, when someone who's walking it with you is calling out the Imago Dei in you, right? So yeah. they're calling out. And so, but what I find is that the next thing that God deals with, and he's, he lets you celebrate and just cheer step number one, right? But then he will start going, Mm -hmm. You know, just softly, the Spirit of God talks to you, mm -hmm. and He'll do it all sorts of ways, right? And so, the, to me, the thing that is usually first dealt with is what's going to kill you. God needs us to live, right? So, and we wrestle with that on that journey until maybe down at door number, you know, 72, He's talking about the unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, because that's not as visible, but it's going to kill you or whatever. Right. But, then, but then I think sometimes those of us who might have walked through 116 doors— like we've been on this journey for a long time. I think where we, or I can miss it, is that I get there and I look back at somebody coming in at door number one. And I just am like, get on with it. Yeah. Get a move on. Yeah. As opposed to going, I see God in you and I got you. Yeah. Hold my hand. Here we go. Yep. And then you're going to fall. And rather than going, I can't believe you messed up again. Right. All right. Let me help you up. Here we go. So good. He's still in you. I love that. All right, so to me, that's yes. our job. Absolutely. Right? Is to walk next to people on the journey. Yeah. You and I have the option for two things. We can live a life full of expectations, or we can live a life full of expectancy. We can look at people and scenarios and constantly have expectations of how we hope they'll show up for us or perform for us or do good for us or love us or what they'll do. And if we do that, if we live a life full of expectations, we'll often always be disappointed. But if we live a life full of expectancy, saying we can and will see God do good in us and in other people, we can and will see God bring grace, even when we may make mistakes and other people make mistakes, we will be encouraged. And so when we kind of crash this idea of expectations on God and on people, our expectancy rises. And we're encouraged and other people are encouraged and there is so much less disappointment and defeat overall. Oh, Father. Father, I thank you so much for, God, for your word. Your word, which is truth. Your word, which is life. I'm grateful. And God, we've, we've talked this week just about what it means to be made in your image. And what a privilege that you trusted us with your image, with who you are, to bring shalom, to bring peace, to bring your presence to a pretty broken world. You trusted us with your image. And I ask God that you would forgive me for times when I didn't see it in me when I doubted who you said I was. I asked God that you would forgive me for times when I didn't see it in other people, when I engaged in conflicts that weren't mine to engage in. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I ask that you would forgive me for that. And, and I just pray, God, for the church, your church around the world, your church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. I pray for your church that we would truly reflect your image your image in every corner, every nation, every city, that your church would rise strong and reflect your image, your image of grace and forgiveness and peace and kindness, that we would be known as those people who bring your presence into situations. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 To live a cruciform life that's shaped and formed like a cross means we live our lives every day thinking, how can I reach out to somebody else and show them the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and actually edify and encourage them in their everyday life? That's not a burden on us. That actually is what we're made to do, which ends up being our greatest joy. And in giving to other people, we actually get the grace of healing ourselves.